Neuroticism was also my first time in the studio. Uh, it was also my first time in the studio with Carcass. It was my second time in a studio full stop, in a, in a real studio. And um, yeah, I mean, I guess I just kept in the background a bit. I mean, you know, I wasn't really sure how everything worked. And we, we're, I think it was great that we had a Colin Richardson producing. It was good that we had a producer. Was the first time we went to Park Street. Yeah, yeah. that was out in those days. Oh, yeah, it was, yeah. It was out in sort of outside Liverpool somewhere. It's uh, about 12 inches tall. It's on vinyl. Okay. Eight tracks. Eight tracks. The budget was even bigger. See what's happening here? We're spending a larger budget, but less songs. <laughs> Pop, isn't it? <laughs> was a good, an excellent guitarist uh, who played in a similar style to Bill and uh, they because they they managed to gel so well yeah yeah I mean I think um, like I mentioned actually you know on the, on the Thursday the thing with him was um, he got in the band and um, we just trusted him I mean it wasn't like oh you're just gonna play a second guitar we actually trusted him to come up with riffs and he, he did come up with great riffs so yeah, it was just brilliant. It just expanded the whole range of the band, really. Yeah, certainly. I mean, a lot of the stuff he came up with was really catchy. And the same, I mean, for the Heartwork record, the same thing. Um, but, you know, some really strong riffs. It's like a big jig, it was like a jigsaw puzzle every song, wasn't it? Lots could of I, riffs. Could I be complete swipes and throw this into the equation? Yeah. The period you weren't virtuosos by that point. You were still... Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's, that's what made the sound as well. You still Absolutely. learned to play. Yeah, because like we were when, we did, when we did the third record, we, we still didn't really know how to play solos properly, but we... we how do you explain the first yeah. this attack demo when you were like shredding? I was not shredding. You fucking were. Well, I haven't <laughs> heard that for a while, but I don't okay. think it was. I'm going to stick this on this uh, yeah. everything. Yeah. No, I mean... But I think we were just exploring with uh, the guitar thing, and that, that was like a huge deal, wasn't it? It was like, we were just always thinking guitar. Yeah, Everything yeah, was very focused around guitar and and the technical riffs and shredding and playing. Yeah, I mean, with, with the, like, as far as the guitar thing goes, with with the shred business, I mean, once we started to get even close to it, then we realised it wasn't worth it. Do you know what I mean? Like that was more or less what happened, wasn't it? Like after a while, we realised you couldn't really tell the difference between half of those guys, and then we started to sort of gravitate towards players who are a little bit more. You know, individual, whatever. So we wanted a two pronged guitar attack kind of, with uh, oh, guitar harmonies and uh, double solos. The first time he showed me a riff, I thought, yeah, that's a good riff, we'll use that. So there was just automatically a trust and relationship there, and it just went from that, from, from that situation onwards, really. So um, that was all, it's all really positive. Looking back, it, it's very fortunate because. It's not easy to find a guitar player you've got some kind of harmony with, and um, with us too, it was really good. And um, it was the, it was the key to, to Carcass moving forward in a sense because um, you know we we'd done a bit of stuff as three piece, and we did the second record, which was respectable. But um, as far as a live act, we needed a second guitarist to really project what we were doing. Michael came in at the right point. And then when we did the third record, yeah, there was just loads more riffs there because we had Ken was still kicking in riffs, and then I had my riffs, and then there was Michael as well. You say kicking? So yeah, I'm <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'll, I'll go back yeah. to English. In a <laughs> Well, interestingly enough, right, we've done two albums for Earache, but the third one, we had no record contract. And we'd managed to, we'd come back from America and somehow managed to blow about 18 grand, you know, $30,000 from getting ripped off and destroying an RV in a bizarre Guardian accident yet again. And uh, we were labelless. 
but we, we had enough money come through from Earache on the um, royalties. Now, I bet, I bet you never thought you'd hear a band say that, did you? <laughs> we had some money in the band, maybe we had about 16 grand. And basically, we started recording the album, you know, with our own money. And then, you know, we started talking to Earache and the label Roadrunner at the same time. And they made the most laughable offer ever. Remind me to bring it in tomorrow and you can film it. You can have a look at it and then show, show the kids you know what it's like. And these labels are trying to screw you. We were, we were labeled this, we had the money, we started recording the album. And whilst that was happening, we got Martin to become our manager and we managed to broker a deal with Eric and re signed to them. That was done in Kirby, or past Kirby in Liverpool, Simmons Wood, it's over that way. How much was that? Uh, yeah, I'm just glad to Let's run! No, I mean, but you know, him joining the band kind of coincided with Jeff totally taking over the lyric side yeah. of the band. Um, uh, being getting dumped with is more of the record, yeah, so. yeah, <laughs> yeah. At that point, it sort of I, I, I've forgotten the word you'd use now, but like everyone ended up with their specific tasks in the band. So yeah, Jeff was like in charge of like the Delegated. visual. Yeah, that's the word. Thank you. <laughs> you know, he ended up like doing the lyrics and taking care of the visual side of the band. Uh, Ken's drum kit was going by the day, and. Uh, What's that? I have to take care of the hair as well. And yeah, and he had the dreadlocks, which was an important factor. And um, and then me and Michael were just, you know, at that point, getting trying to become guitar players, really. So yeah. A lot of chunk of it was written before he came in. Yeah, I mean, there was definitely things like the first track on that third album. I think that was just, you know, musically that was me and Ken, like. We spent ages on that first song. I mean, it was about yeah. however many riffs in it. Yeah, about eleven. Months. Yeah, and there was, you know, it was like half yours, half mine, or something. Yeah. Um, so things like that were already there. But it's pretty obvious the impact you had because when you get to tracks that he was involved with, like before the jigsaw, one really kind of solid. That's when you can hear what was really going to happen on the next album. Would you class necrotism as um, death metal or grindcore? It's, I don't think it's grindcore by any stretch of the imagination, so... Well, then we've kind of moved away from that stage. I, I don't think it's death metal, really, but it is, it's kind of more progressive, isn't it? Yeah, it's progressive, yeah. Excised and anatomised, deviscerated in disarray, the torso diverged with pride. Deftly amputated, evolved limbs now defunct. The trunking brood, tassy stumps used as lugs. For conjuring puzzles so quaint, head and body decollate, a heaving mass so quescent. Scattered and scrambled, your teasement grows. Bloody caricature to make whole. A squirming grisly jigsaw, detrital fragments fit so snug. That missing piece will leave you stumped. Totally disassembled, nicely sliced and diced. A cold mannequin once reassembled. A real cranium teaser, carved from flesh and bone. So mystifying. Uh, you know, with the extreme death metal bands, uh, 
or whatever we were. I don't think people were, you know, like serious sound engineers, and they'd be like, well, I had Magnum in here last week, you know, and it's like, uh, okay, and now, yeah, but we wanted to be like this. We wanted to be extremely brutal, you know, <laughs> lots of crazy stuff, and the music was just totally insane to them, so. Yeah, I mean, these days, there's an official way of recording our music, because yeah. obviously new metal and all that. Um, you know, you've got because apps, of you just, metal, you you just know, dial yeah. in the tone, it's just there, you know, there's a setting or whatever. But in those days, you had to really work on it, and that included recording in a studio and finding an engineer who could tolerate what you're doing. Yeah, so. And that's what Colin Richardson was. When we met him, it was just a godsend because he was really open minded. Took you, I mean, he took you seriously. You know, in those days, I mean, you could call it being fickle or whatever, but when you're younger, you'll go through things really quickly, so you'll have a, a, a phase on something, and it feels like it's really intense and lasts a long time, but it's really just six months or a year. So you can see that with Carcass a bit. With the third record, we got into very complex music. Um, I can't really, there's probably various um, yardsticks we would have used, but for some reason we thought that all the songs had to be very complicated. Well, it was a better equipped studio, we had a bigger budget, and by this but, point, more of an idea of what we were doing by then as And uh, Colin had been the house engineer in Slaughterhouse, and that place had burnt down. And it's one of the first times he'd gone to a different environment after that and, and started to actually you know, produce and not just be like the house engineer. So uh, we had better equipment, the studio was better. I mean, I would like to say we were better rehearsed, but I don't think we were. I can never remember practicing. <laughs> well, probably I didn't turn up. You no, probably by, did. by then, though, we'd done quite a few gigs. We just shot yeah. and stuff a lot as well. Just because of how Colin is, he he's just um, he's very particular, isn't he? Yeah, and he's and he's he's very much about the sonic kind of aspects. I mean, he wasn't that picky about our performances. It was more about. The sound we were producing, he, and he was just he'd it. worked with punk bands like Discharge and Exploited, and so he's pretty open minded, you know. Yeah. So we, you know, though, but it's yeah. also got endless yeah, patience. You know, so. we're not like yeah, so. dying, dying the wall kind of heavy metal band, so. Yeah. But then it doesn't explain why the guitar sounds so shit and symphonies and the crosses and it's my personal. Yeah. Bad <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, you're right. came down, did looking like photographs of us in different positions. Like Mike in the bath, uh, <laughs> Ken was dogging somewhere. And, uh, and then we went round to Ken's uh, dad's surgery, he was a vet. When I was young, we used to go and see my dad operate on animals, and I kind of like uh, helped to. Uh, Bring together all the ideas that I used to have when I was a kid. The kind of like, imagery of that was fixed in my head. So uh, last year we we used uh, my dad's surgery on the necroticism album to take photos for the cover. I mean, it was totally done on the fly. There was no real, you know, grand idea behind it. I mean, I had a vague idea of what I was trying to do, but it was really kind of thrown together. That's what's so funny about it. I mean. A lot, of, you know, it's funny. People would think it's all been done in Photoshop, but it's not. I mean, it's you know, real photographs laid out on the a gurney, another camera taking the photograph. My hands in a in a wheelie bin or a pedal bin. Ken's there with a hammer, all that was shot. And, you know, it's total total analog. It's all all involves valves and big dials and knobs and things. It's just like yeah. none of this Photoshop digital rubbish. The problem is with the, the old Cox catalogue. We have no problems getting it stocked from the shops. Like countries like Germany wouldn't stock it anyway, so I guess it's a more user-friendly version of what we've done in the past. Dad used to 
come to some of your gigs, didn't he? Used to come and see us play a Planet X, yeah, in the old days. Kind of funny having your dad come down to see Death Metal Gig. Oh, I'm not sure he, he really particularly liked the crowd or anything, or, the, or got on well, well with them, but uh, I think he's, his nature is that he can accept what's happening around him without kind of uh, complaining or uh, judging people. And um, what did he actually think, think of the actual music? Did he understand it, appreciate it? He'd always been into kind of classical music and some of the elements of uh, classical we, we used to kind of pinch ideas occasionally. So I think he uh, appreciated what the kind of musical melodies that we were using but he didn't actually understand the, uh, the, the uh, intensity of the music that we were doing either. How um, was your music inspired by classical music? Uh, well. Vivaldi Four Seasons, I think uh, one of the riffs on that we, we kind of took and adapted to our own uses. And uh, I think from the Four Seasons album, or uh, Four Seasons uh, record. Do you think your, your fans would be surprised to hear that? Um, well, the structures, the complexity of Carcass had to come from somewhere, so... I mean, Bill also used to listen to classical music, and uh, he probably uh, was influenced by them himself, so... I'm not sure fans would be too uh, bothered about that, or, or too surprised. <laughs> material is just taking, you know, turning another leaf in the book of Carcass, you know, it's just more melody, more heaviness, more, more, more just, compact, yeah, just, just more compact, more up front and just getting better at what we're doing. Yeah. Do you find actually that when you come to writing songs and recording that there are certain things you won't do because you don't think your fans are ready for it? No, there's certain things we won't do because Think it's Bands have been done, yeah, or uh, it's a cliche or, or something. Yeah. But fair, you know, we must remember that we, we do it for ourselves <clears throat> first and foremost, and that's you know we try to please ourselves. And if you want to put an acoustic guitar in there, we'll do it, you know, without. But we won't stop to more think. More likely, we'll avoid doing it because that's so bloody cliched yeah. anyway. So keyboards yeah. and stuff. So uh, that's why there's hardly any keyboards, or whatever, on, on the latest album because <clears throat> it's been becoming the thing to do, you know, just like. Stick a keyboard on there, and then wow, that's really original, you know. And uh, I don't know. No, we no, we never stop to think, you know, about what well, all oh, the fans may not like this, or whatever, you know. If we want to have a whole a song that's just completely mid-paced, heavy metal type song, we'll do it, you know. We did it on the last album, but. Well, Ken, Ken, Ken came up with discounting the insalubrious. Discounting the insalubrious means talking about something that's unwholesome. Or sing, singing about something unwholesome. is to sing. Well, is it discounted? Isn't that to kind of almost like filter? Isn't it? No? Like what the word means? Discount? It means like to sing. Is it? Yeah. There you go, I've learned something every day. And necroticism is just to play on two words, necro, as in, you know, when things die or are dead, and erotica. So, you know, play on words. Where did you end up touring with this album? Europe, America, Wigan. <laughs> there was the, <clears throat> this was the album where you, your touring career really started to take off, yeah? No, I'd say that with symphonies. I wouldn't call it a career, I mean, we just started to travel a bit more. Uh, we, you know, by this point we had a manager, Martin. We got a bit more professional. I mean, only by the dictionary definition of you get paid. Um, I don't think I don't think things ever took off with carcass. I mean, we're going to touch on that with that last question that I had a subject for about are you better? <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't say our tour really took off. 
Had you played festivals before? We've never played festivals. Back then there were no big festivals. There was a dynamo in Holland, that was it. Yeah. Nowadays you can't fall out of bed without tripping over a festival. It's just ridiculous. I mean there's so much money involved and so many bands, but back then you've got to understand it was nowhere near as big as what it is now, the rock and metal scene. I mean it was if you were Aerosmith or Guns N' Roses, but for a band on our level, might have done a punk old day or somewhere in Birmingham in 1988 at the Barrel Organ. Is that class? Is that playing Glastonbury or, uh, you know, but Donington? Not... <laughs> did you, how big did you think you were going to get at that point? What, what, what were you hoping for from the band? What were your aspirations? To sell, to, uh, sell 2,000 albums. Yeah. yeah, we know we're good, so. I mean, when you see what's popular with that whole death metal thing now, I mean, uh, if stuff like that can sell, then. Christ, we should be selling about ten times as much. But maybe that sounds arrogant, that's the way it is. So. No, I mean, I don't know. Uh, to play as far as a field as possible as well. Really, that's my aspirations. I don't think we were ever driven, you know, we were never driven by having a career, trying to make money. We just kind of doing it. I mean, we were kind of lost. I mean, I had left school, signed on the door. Bill had fucked off his, uh, you know, going to university, which is basically what he might fall into doing. I mean, Ken, you know, was more grounded, he carried on, but for the most part, I think we were just lost teenagers playing in a band, yeah. fucking about. Expanded after we moved in. Uh, recently, we had Bill's parents over in Aswell. Where, uh, the neighbours got sick of us, so we got kicked out after a few years. I used to travel two hours each way from where I was living back home in St. Helens on a Friday. We'd wait for Ken after he finished school. He'd come over and we'd rehearse. So, so we, we started rehearsing here. We had a, a permanent room for a while. And uh, that's about as interesting as it gets, to be honest. Do we have a look inside? Maybe. To be honest, it's changed inside there, but anyway, so... Well, you can tell us how it's changed when we get inside. <sighs> yep, it's Marco John. Uh, no. Just drop in, I would have thought maybe Marco John would be around. No, it was this, this, this one. That's the one, I'll yeah, yeah, that's room two, yeah. yeah. yeah one, three, three. Cheers, nice one. Thanks, mate. So this is your where you used to rehearse. Yeah, I mean that's where we got kit up bills. This is where we mostly were holed up. Mm. Does it change yeah. much? No, it's the same. Just keep all gear in here. Does it bring memories? What have been bored shitless, drinking too much tea. <laughs> I think that, that's why Ken's probably stayed in the car because we always insist on rehearsing early. And he's a kind of nighttime kind of chap, so he'd always turn up really pissed off at 11 in the morning, really angry because he'd have to get out of bed. A bit light. That's one. Okay, okay yeah. Well done, yeah. Uh, Thanks, Again, because we always got these gigs, because no one else, you know, we always got sloppy seconds. What happened there is Mick and Shane from Napalm had been invited to do it because Napalm had been on, um, what's his name, Craig, Craig Charles. Charles. Mm. He'd, um, he'd done a TV show for kids called What's That Noise, and Napalm Death had been on it. So obviously he was in the show and he asked Napalm to be on it. But Mick and Shane, for whatever reason, balled out of doing it. 
So Dig was going to do it, of all people, and Martin, our man, who later became our manager, he worked at Eric. But they didn't have an NUS card. What am I? What, NUS? Fucking <laughs> <laughs> students. Uh, sorry, uh, MU card. Or uh, what do you call it? Equity? Yeah. And uh, we had music union status, so basically, Bill had just quit Napalm, but we still got to do it anyway. Craig Charles was none the wiser. I heard that. Um well, I've, heard, I've heard two different things. One is that when he booked you, he thought you were Napalm, because he booked Bill and thought he was still in Napalm. And also that he was a big fan of yours and he used to come to all your shows. Where did you get that from? Um, I'll put it this way, I met him maybe two, two years after that, or the Black Horse and Rainbow here, and I said, do you remember me? I was on that program with you. And his reply was, the people's poet. Of course you were, mate. Complete look of disdain. So, so the moral of the story is don't go up to any actors ever. It'd be nice to punch them, get the first punch in. As usual, we were that desperate, we'll do anything, you know? Sloppy seconds again. Sloppy seconds again, yeah. yeah. Getting back to the death threats, there was one other one. Yeah, no, there was one in, in the States, which I didn't know about until after the fact. Because we played in, I think, in Denver, Colorado. And um, one of you lot... Was it you me? Kept... Are you accusing me of writing No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Ken no. came up and said to me later that day, hey, don't worry, it's all all right with the bloke from... <laughs> and that's what, which bloke? He's like, you know, the bloke from around here who's been sending the letters. I had no idea what he's talking about. It was totally weak, it was just Martin flapping over nothing. It was like some scribbled notes of a 12 year old yeah, embassy. I've still got the letter in there. There's one letter that was like about 24 pages and uh, involves the four horsemen of the apocalypse. No, right. Apparently, I was one of them, but I, I was going to have to die at some point. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I found out about that after we played, so it was alright, you know, and the guy was actually locked away by that point. But, um, Remember we met the guy, the, the guy who dug, dug up the grave? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. there's this shit in the state. Well, it's obviously obvious what happened, isn't it? Some kids also got stoned in a graveyard. The cops turn up and they're listening to carcass. Next thing you know, it's in. Like a magazine like Kerrang! just exaggerates, makes shit up. Oh, yeah, they're digging up a grave, listening to carcass. I think the lad got, like, banged up for a week. Then we met him and he seemed per per perfectly rational. Yeah, no, he seemed fine. But that was, you know, a good couple yeah, of years, actually. Yeah, the soil of his nails, so. <laughs> <laughs> An incessant game, methodically made, with each cumulative piecing of compensated meat. By manual reconstruction, eldritch problem complete, a conveited effigy, a pathological toy, each chunk rigorously, into mortis locking, as you pathogenically rot. Such a perplexing task to fit the remains in the casket, religious mess so coescent. An incessant game, methodically made, with each cumulative piece of compensated meat.